All right, we're going to continue on with the old school, new school hand analysis, and we're going to look back all the way to, I think it was 2006, in the Tournament of Champions, three-handed with uh, Mike Matisseau and the late, great Mike Sexton. And uh, this hand here that comes up, we're playing with, we're going to start this by doing it, of course, with sort of an old school hand analysis approach, and then we're going to redo the hand from the new school modern perspective. So, blinds are 5,000, 10,000 with a 1,000 ante. Uh, in this hand, I'm sitting on 1 million in chips. Sexton has 1.2 as chip leader. And Mikey has 426,000. So, we're doing pretty good here. Okay, three-handed. Mike goes ahead and raises to 3x, 30,000 on the button. You know, pretty standard for that era to come in for, you know, him with that hand and that sizing, whatever. I'm in the small blind. I got a hand that you're always just going to just flat call with. Um, and again, remember, I'm coming from old school mentality. Six, seven of diamonds, you know, you don't want to three bet this hand because you want to see a flop with it. Um, and I don't want to bloat the pot out of position. So that's a hand I'm always going to call with here, three-handed and take a flop and hope that we hit gin. And if not, maybe we can uh, do some shenanigans and, you know, pull this pot away from Mattiso somehow because, you know, that's a thing. Like he plays tight in certain spots and maybe we can, you know, bluff him out if we do miss or if we do flop a draw, maybe we can do some fun stuff. So Mike Sexton folds king nine offsuit in the big blind, um, which, you know, three-handed. Back then, people thought of that as like, okay, you know, whatever, king nine. But, you know, you don't really fold that today, especially, you know, three-handed when you're the chip leader in that spot. So now we got about 70,000 in this pot. The flop comes ace, king nine. So I've completely whiffed. I mean, I do have a backdoor flush draw, whatever. But my plan right here is like, I'm not going to mess with Mikey if he bets his flop. You know, if he bets his flop, I'm going to give him credit for an ace or a king, you know. That's a big part of the hands that he, you know, he like he's, he has, he's going to open pretty much every ace and a lot of his kings, but I don't know. I don't think he bets a king every time, but he's going to always bet an ace and he, he can bluff me sometimes too, but that's okay. I mean, he's not really bluffing me because I've got seven high, right? So I check expecting to just check and fold, but Mikey checks back. Okay. Now the turn card is like a really good card for me. It's the five of diamonds. Okay. So now I've got like the flush draw and the straight draw. And I figure if I check, Mike's probably going to bet, um, anyway, or, well, you know, and so like if he bets, I have to call and he might bet, he might bet more. So I'm going to do like, what well, you know, like a blocker type bet where I bet 30,000 and, you know, into 70, you know, kind of small size and just try to hit my hand, you know? Um, and I, you know, to this point, if Mike, Mike has tens or jacks, I figure he'll, you know, he'll, he'll fold those hands against me. Um, but you know, you're not sure of that. And if he does call, so it's okay. I got a lot of outs, right? So uh, I also don't think he's going to raise me all that often, but maybe that's not true. You know, maybe he would raise, but like, what's he going to raise with? Actually, you know, he might raise, what the heck. But again, I think Mike, for the most part, back in those days, like he doesn't let free cards come off that much. He, he didn't slow play all that much. So if he has an ace, he's just gonna, he's gonna put pedal to the metal. And if he did slow play flop, he's probably gonna go ahead and slow play turn again when I bet. So I go ahead and bet the 30,000. Now we got 130,000 in the flop, in the pot. And the river's the queen of diamonds, right? So that's a big, fat, juicy card. Um, I make my flush pretty, pretty strong. I'm not worried about being beat here, right? Because like, what the hell does he have? I figure if he had nothing, if he just had two random diamonds, he's probably going to bet the flop, just take it, um, unless he just didn't want to bluff at it. Um, and you know, that's a card where like, he could make some two pair type hands. Like he did call the turn, right? So like, he could have king queen. He could have like, I don't know, he could still have ace queen, probably not pocket queens or 10 jack. I don't think he would call with 10 jack or he would probably bet the flop with 10 jack. So anyway, I figure this is kind of like a hit or miss spot where there's no point in just, you know, pussyfooting around. I'm going to try to get max value here. So I go ahead and bet 120,000 into 130,000. Um, putting Mike to the test here, but, uh, you know, sizing up, trying to target some hands that uh, I think Mikey would call with. And he does make the call uh, after flopping aces and nines. So that one worked out pretty well. Um, pretty lucky, yeah. Okay, so that's old school, right? You know, hey, Lucy Goosey, what are you going to do? Da, da, da. We're going over the hand once more time. Rewind. Here we go. Okay. So, modernize the situation. Okay. With the blinds at 5,000, 10,000, Mattisau opens to 30,000 with the ace nine. Um, already, this is a situation where, like, it's really not ideal when you're uh, sitting on about 43 big blinds at this situation and effective because your opponents have more chips than that. That's still considered pretty shallow. And uh, generally speaking, what we know about theory is you want your sizes to be a lot smaller. Back in the old days, people did come in for 
race size is three, four, five times the big blind, but we've learned. I mean, I didn't. I knew about this before it was in vogue, if you will. I was already lowering my race size because it made sense to me. Um, but common theory back then was this was okay, making it three times the blind, uh, three-handed. But I think we know now this is just not really that good. I mean, it's not a huge mistake, right, in the bigger you know, bigger picture, but uh, it's not ideal to be opening with ace nine. Now from the small blind, and you, as you heard me in the old school version say, you know, this is a hand I'm always going to flat with because I don't want to three bet and boot the plot and all blah, 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 right? Um, yeah, that's no longer necessarily how I would view the situation. Six, seven suited. It is a, um, it's actually a decent hand to three bet bluff with occasionally. The, the concern here is stack sizes. You know, Mattiso has made it three X and he's sitting on 43 blinds, so you don't have a ton of wiggle room to make a three bet on this stack. If you're 100 big blinds deep, I would actually suggest that if you're going to play the 6-7 suited, that you should be three betting it predominantly, right? Not flatting with it. Um, And it's a great hand to uh, plug into your three bet range as far as the bluff ends, right? Because you should be three betting against the button open a pretty significant percentage of the time because the button open is going to be pretty wide, right? So, you're going to want to do that with your strong hands, your ace, king, ace, queen combos, you know, big pairs, etc. But you're going to also want to have some bluffs for the sake of board coverage, which is something we talked about in the past video. Um, you don't want to play so linear where everyone knows when you're three betting, your range is so limited that it's just big cards, big pairs. You want to have some board coverage with some small pairs occasionally and some hands like six, seven suited, seven, eight suited, five, six suited, etc. So uh, again, I think I'm okay with this call. Under the circumstances, you could make an argument for just folding um, in this case because of the stack size being awkward. And, you know, when you think about tournament poker, the ICM implications of me being solidly in second place with the chip leader behind me. Having said that, knowing what we know about the chip leader, he's folding king nine offsuit in the big blind. So we're not all that concerned about, you know, him squeezing in this situation since he's playing pretty snug, as you can tell. So analyzing it over, I'm okay with the call, but it's not nearly the slam dunk that uh, I made it out to be in the old school analysis and how I would have approached it and sort of after, you know, doing some updated information and knowledge about how to play the small blind three-handed um, and it being okay to three bet. And you can, what you need to do normally. So for example, if you are 100 big blinds deep, someone opens for 3X, your raise size should be to 15. So they make it, you know, 3X, you make it 15X to anywhere from 12 to 15, but 15 is completely fine. Now, when you're sitting on 40 big blinds effective, that can't be the thing. You, you, 15 is essentially putting the player all in, if you will, because you can't like put 15 in and then fold for like 30 more. That's putting yourself in really bad mathematical situations. So you want to make your race sizes much smaller. So when Mike comes in for three, you're probably going to have to make it somewhere between eight to nine, like 10 is pushing it, right? Because now you're talking about putting in 25% of the chips. But again, if you made a normal race size, which was a min raise, or, you know, 2.2x or something like that against the min raise, you could probably make it 6.5 to 7x, which is reasonable off of 40 big blinds. And then, of course, if Mike would go all in, you're folding the 6.7 suited. If he flats, that's okay. You have a hand that, uh, you know, can hit a lot of flops. So, okay, we make the call, and the flop comes, ace-king-9, rainbow. So in this case, who has range advantage? It's quite clear that uh, Mike is going to have a higher percentage of big hands. He's going to have all of the ace king combos. He's going to have pocket nines. He's going to have, uh, you know, uh, pocket kings, pocket aces. As I said, ace king, he's going to probably have more ace nines than I do as well. Um, but so that puts me in a situation where I'm basically deferring to him. And you're always, you're all almost always in a case where your opponent has range advantage on a flop. You just check to them, right. To protect, you know, your entire range. And, you know, you sort of go, okay, go ahead. So I'm never leading here besides I have nothing. I check, and Mikey likes to check back, which he should be doing at a frequency with uh, a combination of strong hands, like sets, two pair or better, and just an ace. And a decent part of his range that he should check back here is probably just a king. So like a hand like king 10 or king jack. Um, And then, of course, you know, some of his air. You don't necessarily, just because you have air in this spot doesn't mean that you auto c-bet. You should be checking back uh, some of your air as well as your good hands. So now the turn card is the five of diamonds. And I'm going to need some bluffs here if I'm going to be betting, okay? I couldn't think of a better bluffing candidate than the bottom of my range here. This is the absolute pure bottom of my range, right? Seven high. It's very difficult to assume that I have a worse hand than this. And generally speaking, 
you know, it's not a bad idea to polarize your bets where you're betting with your air, your absolute no chance to win at showdown, and then your very, very strong hands and play a little bit more carefully with the mid part of your range. So this is a really good spot for me to go ahead and bet. Um, betting 30,000 into 70 is probably fine, right around 40% pot. Um, if I were to go back and do it again, I'd probably bet closer to 30%, maybe 25%. But again, 40% is not a mistake. Um, and I do think betting here with this specific hand is something that you should be doing at a very, very high frequency. With the intention, though, of, and this would be different than the old school, my intention is betting this hand because I'm going to call it anyway, and then if I catch, I'll try to get value. Fast forward to today, I'm betting this turn card with every intention of following it up with another barrel on the river, right? I'm not betting this 30,000 with the intention of just giving up on the river. I'm going to apply maximum pressure um, against the range that is going to be pretty King X heavy, right? If Mike just checks back this flop, calls turn, you expect him to do that with a decent amount of King 10, King Jack, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if I fire another large barrel on the river, um, he's going to be under a lot of duress because, you know, I could still have a lot. I could have an ace. I could have aces up. I could have a whole bunch of hands that do beat him. So the biggest shift to the modern idea is I'm not just betting this because, hey, I got a hand that's got equity. I'm betting this to set up a third barrel or another barrel on the river to continue the story, right? That would be probably the biggest shift from 2004 era to 2021 is these little stabs, these little, you know, shots at pots um, were just that. And they were not followed up, at least for me anyway, with another barrel or with a thought process of doing that. Whereas today, I'm not throwing that bet out on the turn if I don't also consider, you know, what do I do when I miss on the river? And my plan uh, is going to be predominantly to fire turn and river with the bottom of my range. As it turns out, I um, go ahead and make that flush. So now I'm pretty much in the nutted part of my range, you know, the top 10, 15% of, you know, the possible hands that I could have here. So uh, I think this is a good spot to size up because we, we mentioned that, you know, Mike is going to have a hand that, uh, you know, the weaker kings are folding probably anyway to medium size or lower, you know, like or smaller bets, like blocker bets. Um, but if he does have two pair of better, which is the hand we target, he's probably going to be more apt to call off a bigger size. So, um, in these kind of situations, when you're assessing your opponent's range, uh, you know, uh, this is a little bit exploitative, which is fine, but if you feel like they are going to have a hand that if you feel like their calling range is going to call large, just as often as they would call like half pot or less, then you should go ahead and do that and sacrifice the sometimes where they have hands that they might call a blocker bet with that fold to a bigger size. Because in the long run, that will still pay off. So for example, if you bet 30% pot and you're going to get a call from all of his kings, right? Whereas you bet full pot and you only get called by half of his kings, you're still doing better. You know, you're still doing better overall in the long run because you're picking up extra chips when you do make the larger size. Um, but you do have to factor in, okay, so when I am betting this, what am I saying that I have, right? Because I'm polarizing my range. So what part of my range can bet turn and bet this size on the river? It's kind of limited, right? It's flushes, you know, but there's not a ton of those. Combos like 6-7 suited, 7-8 suited, sure. Um, some 10 jack of diamonds, some 8-9 of diamonds, different things. But that represents, you know, six to eight different combinations of hands. Um, the question is, can I also, uh, you know, fire like jack? Can I throw jack 10 straights in there? Yes, I think so. So that represents... I think at that stage, that represents all the Jack-10s, because I think I'm calling there with all my Jack-10s uh, back then anyway. So that's 16 combos of value, plus the six or eight. So I've got about 24 now we're talking about. And then sets, if I do have pocket nines, you know, that's another three. Uh, so what I'm thinking about here now is like, do I have enough value combos at that sizing to uh, be able to you know, bet that size? And if not, if they've, let's say, for example, I only had flushes and I only had six combos can't really get away with betting that size because it's going to be difficult to, uh, to balance that in the long run. So, uh, yeah. So again, um, I guess in retrospect too, like knowing what I know now about my game back then or just whatever, like he could actually fold his hand here because when you factor in the number of, you know, value combos that I could have, right. That beat ace nine, what bluffs do I have back then? I didn't have any hands worse, right? 
Now, in theory, you could argue that like a hand like six, seven of spades, seven, eight of spades, you know, should be, you know, running this bluff a decent amount of time. But back then I was not. Today, I, I'd, be more, I'd be more apt to do something like that, especially if I have cards that, you know, uh, interact with the board in some way. Where if, say, for example, I had the 10 of diamonds in my hand or something along those lines. But back then, Mike has ace nine and it looks unlucky. But in theory, if you factored in the way that I was constructing my ranges back then, so all this value, flushes, straights, two bigger pair, but what bluffs do I call the small blind from? Lead turn, bet big on the river. Back then, they didn't exist. Today, they do. I'm a much more advanced player, much better. But uh, again, you know, you play, uh, you play to the area you're in. And back then, it wasn't required of me to run these eccentric bluffs because people were just overcalling, right? Like today, I think that some of the best players in the world would look at that spot against me especially the old me, and they have ace-nine, and they're like, pitch it, right? Because they just, there's not enough bluffs for me to have. And that's why poker is so much more advanced today, so much more difficult, why the players of today are so much better, because they can look at situations that seem like, yeah, what are you going to do? And actually go, oh, hold on, fold. Um, But yeah, so anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that one. Uh, Interesting hand from the old days. Uh, you know, and l- let me know in the comments down below. W- do you think you would have folded the ace nine? And do you agree with my assessment that I don't have any bluffs there back then? Uh, and would you call me in that spot today? Hmm. Let me know in the comments down below. Do a subscribe and a like and all that stuff. You know, hope you guys enjoy the series. We're going to continue on with some cool hands from the old days. Mm-hmm.